Ladies and gentlemen, good Friday afternoon. Thank you for coming to the Atlantic Council. My name is Ariel Cohen. I'm a non-resident senior fellow here, focusing on Eurasia, energy, and things beyond that. We are very privileged today. We have with us Ambassador Irjan Kazakhanov, the former foreign minister of Kazakhstan, who was absolutely key in the recent visit of President Nazarbayev uh, to the United States and the United Nations. We have my good friend and former colleague, Lisa Curtis, Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for uh, Asia at the National Security Council. And of course, last but not least, Ambassador Richard Hoagland, uh, former Ambassador to Kazakhstan and Deputy, uh, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Central Asia. Uh, before I let our esteemed guests to uh, start to kick off, um, I focused on what did it mean uh, for President Nazarbayev to come and visit. And I think most of you will agree with me that Kazakhstan, since its independence, was a model in many senses. It was a model of disarmament policy and non-proliferation policy. It inherited a huge Soviet military arsenal, nuclear arsenal, and by the way, not as well known, other weapons of mass destruction, biological and chemical. And Kazakhstan, as well as Ukraine, uh, led the way, showed the way, how a country can get rid of these horrible weapons of war and attract foreign investment, technical assistance, and really skyrocket on the path of modernization. But Kazakhstan is a model in other things, in, in other aspects, in the aspect of being the economic engine of Central Asia in terms of development, in terms of education, in terms of being a model of a majority Muslim country that is secular, essentially, and that does not uh, oppress religious practice, but at the same time does not allow uh, this or other way of extremism to dictate policies of the country. And finally, and I'll stop with that, Kazakhstan is very active internationally. And we have the ambassador to tell us more about it. But think about it. A newly independent country, a country that gained independence only 25 years ago, that unlike the Baltic states or some other countries, did not have a previous iteration of independence, started from the scratch, became a a country chairman of OSCE, uh, became a chairman of Organization of Islamic Cooperation, uh, is on its way uh, to become eventually member of OECD and now is a non-permanent um, member of the Security Council and this month chairs the Security Council. So as you may or may not know, I've written a book about Kazakhstan once, <laughs> so I won't continue in, in that mode and let's start with Ambassador Kazakhanov and then Lisa and Ambassador Hall. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. <clears throat> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen and distinguished guests. Uh, it's a great honor to be here today and to discuss how the relationship between Kazakhstan and the United States uh, continues to strengthen in the light of President uh, Nazarbayev's visit, uh, official visit, I would say, to the United States last week. But first, I would like uh, to take this opportunity and thank uh, uh, colleagues and partners from National Security Council, from the State Department and uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, and other government agencies and for helping to prepare and organize uh, this uh, truly historically significant visit. And uh, I'm grateful to our distinguished panelists, uh, Deputy Assistant to the President, Senior Director of South Central Asia, Ms. Lisa Curtis and uh, my good friend, uh, Ambassador Richard Hoagland, uh, uh, former ambassador to the to Kazakhstan, U.S. ambassador to Kazakhstan and uh, 
And Ariel, uh, also I would like to uh, thank you for being with us and uh, sharing uh, your knowledge, your insight on the partnership between Kazakhstan and the United States, as well as uh, the vast opportunities that uh, two nations uh, are facing ahead. To begin with, uh, I would like to say that uh, during the past 26 years uh, of our bilateral relations, President Nazarbayev paid 11 visits to the United States. Three of them were official visits, two of them were working visits, and uh, uh, President Nazarbayev attended uh, numerous uh, international fora that uh, took place in the United States. Uh, and uh, speaking about the last week visit, uh, uh, during this visit, uh, President uh, Nazarbayev met President Donald Trump, as you know, and uh, Vice President Mike Pence and, uh, and prominent American uh, business executives. The two leaders uh, reaffirmed the independence, territorial integrity, and sovereignty of Kazakhstan, as well as uh, its role in advancing global peace and prosperity. Uh, these meetings have also reaffirmed our country's commitment to foster our cooperation in many areas of mutual interest, such as global politics and regional integration, defense and security, trade and investment, strategic energy dialogue, cultural and humanitarian links, people-to-people -people relations, and etc. Uh, this high-level commitment has been reflected through adoption of the meaningful milestone document entitled United States and Kazakhstan, an enhanced strategic partnership in the 21st century that not only outlines the goals and priorities of our bilateral cooperation, but also sets a long-term vision to advance global peace and prosperity. Speaking about the future plans, uh, the visit reinforced close commercial and trade ties between Kazakhstan and the United States as an important way to create jobs and accelerate economic growth with both in both countries. Uh, both leaders expressed their support uh, for legislation to provide Kazakhstan with uh, permanent normal trade relations and noted that this status will further strengthen the bilateral and trade relationship. Uh, they recognized the recent elevation of the strategic energy dialogue which outlines bilateral energy cooperation. To be precise, uh, during the visit we have signed numerous commercial contracts uh, and documents that have far-reaching implication for both economies including a new agreements between the Boeing company, G Transportation, D G Digital, Chevron, Air Astana, uh, Kazakh uh, Railroad Company, and uh, Samruk Kazana Welfare Fund, uh, and etc. worth of more than 7 billion US dollars. And 2.5 billion of this amount is aimed at the purchase of US products and services. As noted in the course of bilateral discussions at the White House and Naval Observatory, Kazakhstan remains strongly committed to promotion of global peace and stability as an elected member of the UN Security Council. And I would like to mention that on the 18th of uh, January, my president uh, pre uh, presided of the, of the Security Council meeting at the UN headquarters. Uh, uh, that was devoted to that was uh, 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 devoted to the issues related to non-proliferation and confidence building measures. In this context, uh, we will continue to champion the course of uh, nuclear non-proliferation and work closely with the United States to encourage greater cooperation to address shared challenges in Central Asia through regional formats such as uh, C5 plus one dialogue, combine our efforts to rebuild Afghanistan, including through empowerment of Afghani women, fight against terrorism and extremism, and if necessary, provide our platform for peaceful talks to address topical issues. 
in course of the visit, the president also agree, presidents also agreed to agreed that efforts to develop human capital are an investment in the future. And President Trump encouraged Kazakhstan's goal to increase English language proficiency and pledged to offer assistance to improve English education programs in Kazakhstani schools. Overall, I would say that this visit exemplified that there is indeed a vast potential to strengthen and enhance our strategic partnership. Both, both sides are now actively working to follow up on an agreements reached and look forward to more cooperation in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Ms. Curtis, Great. the view from the White House. <laughs> having worked together for, I think, eight years at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, it's also such an honor to be up here with Ambassador Kazmikhanov, uh, who we've been working very hard over the last few weeks uh, on the visit, so it's, it's nice to be up here with you in the aftermath. And Ambassador Hoagland, who I've recently gotten to know, but I feel is an old friend because we happen to hail from the same hometown. We yeah. both mm. from uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana. Oh, wow. So, uh, but anyway, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, and, you know, the, the January 16th meeting between President Nazarbayev and President Trump really was a landmark event. Uh, first and foremost, it provided the opportunity for the United States to demonstrate our ongoing commitment to Kazakhstan's independence, its sovereignty, its territorial integrity, something we've done over the last 26 years. And I think the meeting sent a clear signal that the United States is steadfast in its engagement in Central Asia. We want to be in present in this increasingly important region that sits at the crossroads of Europe and Asia. And this region is important to core US national security interests, protecting the American people, promoting American prosperity, and advancing American influence. So during the bilateral meeting between the two leaders, they, they shared a very good rapport. They, they got along very well. They had a very candid, warm conversation. And uh, it's worth mentioning this was not their first contact. They had previously met in 2017 on the margins of the Riyadh summit, and they spoke by phone last September. And both leaders resolved to enhance our strategic partnership and strengthen the existing security, economic, and cultural ties between the two countries. So Kazakhstan has been a leader in promoting dialogue and working for peaceful solutions to complex disputes around the world. And this leadership was on full display during the, its successful presidency of the UN Security Council this month. Uh, Kazakhstan focused on uh, critical issues like global nuclear nonproliferation and the conflict in Afghanistan. During its presidency, Kazakhstan also proposed and organized a UN Security Council visit to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. The visit provided the uh, permanent representatives an opportunity to send a unified international message on their support for the government of national unity and to press for timely and credible elections. Uh, and this visit also helped frame a productive deba debate at the UN last week on partnership between Central Asia and Afghanistan. So President Nazarbayev's visit to Washington also unders underscored Kazakhstan's support for our South Asia strategy. Kazakhstan uh, is sharing in the burden in Afghanistan. It's contributing to the Afghan security forces, training Afghan civilian specialists, and it's even considering participation in some important infrastructure projects. Nazarbayev further reaffirmed the country's pledge to maintain alternate supply routes for the U.S., which would allow us to sustain our forces in Afghanistan without interruption. Let me note that the U.S. is very aware of Kazakhstan's concerns about growing violence in northern Afghanistan and the emergence of pockets of ISIS fighters in the eastern and some northern parts of the country. Another issue that was uh, top on the agenda of the talks was economic cooperation. 
Uh, and the two leaders considered a format to support regular dialogue to improve the business climate in Kazakhstan to attract more U.S. companies who are seeking opportunities there. And let me just say, these efforts are already bearing fruit. During the visit, Kazakhstan concluded major deals with Boeing for 737 and Dreamliner aircraft, as well as with General Electric for locomotives. Uh, these deals together total almost 2.5 billion, and they're go going to support thousands of U.S. jobs. We also completed an air navigation agreement to ease the travel of senior officials between our two countries. And we hope this does indeed bring regular interaction between our officials. And in fact, I had the pleasure of participating on the presidential delegation that traveled to Kazakhstan last August to attend the World Expo 2017. And the Expo grounds will be the future site of the Astana International Financial Center and a technology innovation park. And I have to say, it was truly an amazing thing to see. Um, and lastly, uh, just to mention that Kazakhstan is a charter member of the C5 plus one format. And this is a forum that enhances regional coordination with the United States and provides an appropriate venue to discuss regional economic and trade connectivity. And in fact, Deputy, Deputy Secretary of State Sullivan participated in a C5 plus one dialogue last week in New York City. So in conclusion, I hope that my remarks have demonstrated that this administration remains committed to our partners and friends in Central Asia. And the meeting last week between President Trump and Pe President Nazarbayev offered an historic opportunity to show this commitment and to make tangible progress in strengthening a key strategic partnership. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I think this uh, summarizes uh, and um, explains how this administration, and I must say in a lot of continuity with previous administrations, and Ambassador Hoagland, you were there for quite a few of previous administrations. Yeah. <laughs> so if you can put it in perspective and tell us how do you see that where we are currently and how does it all add up if you, if you go back 25, 26 years ago? We have a thriving relationship. What does it mean and where can it go? Okay, thank you very much, Ariel. Uh, such a pleasure to be on the stage with the ambassador, with Lisa. Um, I give you people great credit for showing up on a Friday afternoon. Uh, this is quite an impressive crowd, and I hope that we can help you pick up a few details you hadn't known before. What I have heard from my colleagues who are still working in the government and who were very much involved with the Nazarbayev visit, as you just heard Lisa say, uh, is that the visit in Washington to the White House and other events in town here was really a solid success. Now. We know that there were no breaking headlines during that visit, and so it might have gone under the radar for some people. But the fact that there were no breaking headlines, I think, is an absolute tribute to the long, solid, healthy relationship, strategic relationship, that the United States and Kazakhstan have built together since the beginning of Kazakhstan's independence. We need to remember that President Nazarbayev, from the beginning, has long worked to position Kazakhstan with multi-vector diplomacy as an honest broker on the world stage, maintaining Kazakhstan's independence and territorial integrity, while at the same time building positive relations with Russia, with China, with the United States, and with the European Union. This is an ach achievement that no other of the five Central Asian countries has really achieved up to this point, even though to one degree or another, they tend sometimes to talk about multi-vector foreign policy. Kazakhstan has done more than talk about it, it's implemented it. And indeed, Kazakhstan has long worked to position itself on the world stage. From the beginning, as we all know, it took the initiative in, non, in nuclear non-proliferation 
It seriously undertook economic reform, which is now paying off handsomely. Uh, in 2010, when it held the chairmanship of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, it hosted the first OSCE summit in many, many years. Um, and then more recently, it's positioned itself to host negotiations on Syria. Again, a bit under the radar, but it shows the respect that Kazakhstan has in, among many, many uh, opposing countries in the world. And then, of course, most recently, it's assumed the temporary chairmanship of the uh, presidency of the UN Security Council. And under the leadership of Kazakhstan's permanent representative, Ambassador Umar, uh, uh, Khairat Umarov, former ambassador to Washington, uh, it sponsored that remarkable visit to Kabul for Security Council representatives that got a little bit of reporting, but again, I think was a real breakthrough, and it was highly creative. It was an important thing to do, because all of you involved in diplomacy and foreign policy know you can read and read and read, but until you get on the ground and meet people and see places, you really don't understand as well as you should. At this point, I'd like to say that the emergence of a reformist government in Tashkent to the south uh, has real promise. I know that previously there was a long standoff between Astana and Tashkent about who should be the so-called leader of Central Asia. I'm truly glad to see the beginnings of more positive and more mature collaboration between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. And we can only hope that grows because a strong and united Central Asia will only reinforce the sovereignty, independence, and prosperity of each of its individual members. Now I'd like to add just one more footnote. We all now inevitably live with uh, digital headlines screaming at us every day. Recently, very recently, several US foreign policy websites have been raising an alarm about Kazakhstan's alleged involvement in a money laundering scheme that might have advantaged uh, the Trump real estate organization. I want to make clear that the Kazakhstani figure in question most in these most recent reports, Mukhtar Blasov, former chairman of BTA Bank, did indeed embezzle as much as $1 billion and then fled the country. But this is not the government of Kazakhstan. The government of Kazakhstan rightly pursued him from the beginning. This scandal is not, I repeat, about Kazakhstan. It's about an international criminal. So with those uh, various opening remarks, uh, I look forward to the discussion and then to your questions. And thank you once again for the opportunity to be here. Thank you very much, Ambassador Hoagland. Uh, this is really a 30,000 feet view that probably helps this audience and all of us. I would like to ask uh, the first question, uh, Ambassador Kazakhanov. This is an important, uh, an important uh, road stop, it's an important development that the president came here. <clears throat> But looking forward, uh, you mentioned the uh, business, you mentioned Boeing, GE, uh, Lisa mentioned that. What are the challenges that the both countries can address together or involve other countries in the region? Um, we mentioned Uzbekistan. There are other countries with a lot of challenges in Central Asia. How can the U.S. be involved without setting off alarms in other capitals around that region? <laughs> well, I think this visit was important uh, uh, because President Nazarbayev not only represented Kazakhstan, but he represented uh, Central Asia as a region. And uh, one of the uh, important developments that are taking place in the region is that we want to increase our integration and our economic cooperation. Uh, 
not too many people in this audience know that, uh, unfortunately, the intra-regional trade in Central Asia takes only 8%. The rest is, I mean, goes outside. So we need to increase it dramatically. <coughs> and we see that the United States can help us in uh, strengthening uh, integration in Central Asia. And speaking about Uzbekistan, we had a visit of my president uh, last year to Tashkent, where President Nazarbayev and President Mirziyoyev agreed to uh, increase the trade turnover between two countries from two existing two billion to five billion in a matter of uh, two years. I think it's a very ambitious goal, and it will help to uh, uh, bring cooperation in the region to the new level, but certainly uh, the U.S. Uh, support in that is very crucial. Second issue, second challenge is Afghanistan. And uh, as uh, uh, it was mentioned here that Kazakhstan and other countries of Central Asia wholeheartedly supported the new South Asia strategy of the United States. And we, we are committed to work hand in hand with our U.S. partners in uh, in uh, stabilizing situation in Afghanistan. And uh, uh, we are proving that by uh, making concrete steps. And uh, uh, as uh, Ambassador Hoagland mentioned, the, the visit of 11 permanent representatives mm -hmm. of the Security Council members to Kabul uh, two weeks ago was a, uh, was a vivid example of Kazakhstan's uh, leadership in bringing Afghanistan problem into the radars of the Security Council. And, uh, uh, and we have uh, an understanding that there is a nexus between security and development. So Central Asian countries want to embrace economically Afghanistan. And we're thinking how we can best organize that. And I think that uh, it is a, is a very important issue. And uh, we are prepared to continue our uh, cooperation with U.S. partners in, in making it happen. Thank you. Thank you. So it's easy for me to follow up, to segue on the topic of uh, Afghanistan to uh, Ms. Curtis. Uh, you served in Pakistan, if I remember correctly, yes. and in India, and Afghanistan is front and center now. Where do you see Central Asia playing a geopolitical role in terms of a supply route, in terms of an example, in terms of a place where people from Afghanistan can go and train because there's a critical lack of skills in Afghanistan. And how can we help with that? Well, first let me start by uh, again thanking Kazakhstan for uh, organizing that trip uh, to Afghanistan. I think it was a very important trip. Uh, uh, General McMaster, National Security Advisor, was able to brief uh, the UN Security Council members about three days before they went on the trip. And by all accounts, the trip was successful. Uh, as I mentioned, it, it showed uh, international unity in supporting the, the uh, government there and also was an opportunity to talk about the importance of a uh, timely and a credible election. Um, and then the follow-up discussion at the UN Security Council uh, also was another opportunity to galvanize uh, the, the uh, Security Council. And I'm sure there's going to be uh, much follow-up on the Afghanistan issue. And in fact, the uh, UN Security Council will be visiting uh, the White House for a meeting with the President on Monday. And I'm sure Afghanistan will be one of the topics that would be discussed. Uh, but when it comes to Central Asia and Afghanistan, I would say the U.S. sees uh, three or four things, you know, really that, that we think uh, Central Asia can contribute to stabilizing Afghanistan. And, and we see a lot of interest uh, in Central Asia. Uh, in you know wanting a secure Afghanistan, understanding that the problems in Afghanistan, whether it be the terrorist problems, ISIS, or the narcotics issue, that uh, these could spill into Central Asia, um, and that uh, there really needs to be more attention to bringing peace uh, to this country. And so you know one of the things is creating the economic linkages, the transportation linkages, rail lines. Um, roads, 
uh, and then looking at the um, uh, economic opportunities trade, increasing the trade between the countries. And as the ambassador pointed out, the training of civilians, um, you know, whether it be educating Afghans in Kazakhstan or, uh, you know, doing training in the country, training um, specialists on, you know, everything IT, agriculture, um, you know, whatever is needed to help develop uh, that economy. Uh, so that's, that's one aspect. Um, the second is in building regional support for a negotiated political settlement of the dispute. Um, we have our South Asia strategy. President Trump uh, enunciated <coughs> that back in August. It's a comprehensive strategy with many lines of effort, you know, military, diplomatic, uh, regional, economic. And uh, we see that, you know, the ultimate uh, objective is a negotiated settlement. And we see how important the regional support for a settlement is in building that regional consensus. So Central Asia has a very important role to play in that aspect uh, of, of uh, resolving the conflict. And then third, I would say uh, political support for the current government and, you know, uh, making the point that this is the uh, legitimate, internationally recognized government, uh, deserves international support, um, deserves regional support. Uh, so I think that uh, there is a very important role for all of the Central Asian countries and, you know, particularly Kazakhstan uh, in this effort. And of course, you know, I mentioned we, we appreciate the uh, sustainment support that Kazakhstan has provided along the northern distribution network. Uh, this has allowed uninterrupted sustainment access for our forces in Afghanistan over the past decade. And we fully expect that to continue in the future, and we, we do appreciate that. Um, and, you know, as I was saying, I think that there, there is concern. We, we've heard concern from our uh, Kazakh friends about uh, increasing violence in northern Afghanistan, uh, the emergence of ISIS uh, strongholds in, in that part of the country. Um, and the, the U.S. is engaged in the fight. You know, mo most people don't realize that more U.S. service members have fallen in combat fighting against ISIS Khorasan or ISIS in Afghanistan than any other group last year. And so we are indeed uh, fighting that threat. And so this, you know, what the U.S. is doing is important for Central Asia um, and also helps Central Asian security. So we look forward to seeing how we can cooperate even more in the future. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Uh, you mentioned uh, the importance of transportation routes. Uh, this is our vision. The, the Silk Road was the term we used, the U US used mm -hmm. for years. Ambassador Hoagland, there is a different vision there called Belt and Road Initiative, BRI, or used to be One Belt, One Road. That was articulated, interestingly enough, in Kazakhstan in a speech to Nazarbayev University in 2013. You, you were there. Yeah. We have witnesses. <laughs> Ambassador Hoagland, if you compare our, res our resources and our priorities in Central Asia, so ably articulated by the senior director here, and the Chinese agenda with alleged $2 trillion dedicated to that over, three, uh, over 30 years, and the Chinese proximity, and the Chinese priorities in terms of infrastructure development. How, we reconcile, how can we coexist there without us losing face or moving out of the area? Because that's not what is in our strategic interest. Well, first, let me say that I don't think that China's goal is to push other countries out of the region. That's very kind of you, Ambassador. <laughs> um, I really don't, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background uh, why I say something like that. But for those of you who like to play trivia, I hope you tucked away that factoid that what is now internationally known, the Belt Road Initiative, was first announced at Nazarbayev University in September 2013. Uh, which makes Kazakhstan, to a degree, the adopted home of Belt Road Initiative. 
Um, look, that was September 2013. By spring of 2014, um, we began to look into what this might possibly be. It was first called the uh, Silk Road Initiative, uh, Silk Road Economic Initiative, we, which was going east and west. We had at that time something called the Silk Road Initiative for North South, linking Central Asia and South Asia all the way into India. Um, but we didn't know very much about it, and I thought we should do more, uh, learn more. At that time, I was uh, still Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for South and Central Asia, and uh, with a little bit of nagging of senior, senior officials, uh, I was given permission to go to Beijing to meet with those people in the Chinese government who were working on this initiative. And you have to remember, this is an initiative that is sort of being made up as it goes. And it has really evolved from those early days. But in any case, uh, toward the end of 2014, I went to Beijing and said, you know, I'm here to learn. We want to see if there's some way that we can cooperate together. And I was received very well. Uh, I was very pleased, uh, very openly with lots of information. And we agreed together that we need to pursue this further. And so uh, I was hoping to go back within six weeks. But it so happens there were some purges going on in Beijing that took away several officials that I had been talking to. So the follow-up visit didn't really happen until um, late or mid-spring, late spring of 2015 into early summer. That time we took, uh, I took a, a little bit bigger delegation, it wasn't just me, from the US government, and we took along a page and a half of proposed areas where we could cooperate. Passed that over to the Chinese, they said they're intrigued, uh, they will get back to us. Uh, but then we didn't hear that much afterward. Uh, and I think that some in the previous administration were not upset that we didn't hear back because behind the scenes mm -hmm. there were really differences of view. Those who said, like myself, that we should be seeking to cooperate with China to the advantage of the countries involved and those who said, no, we should not be cooperating with China. And look what they're doing with the Asian, inv Asian International Investment Bank, which we opposed at the beginning, which was a mistake. And then we stepped back from that mistake. At the moment, um, Kazakhstan is really the key country in Central Asia, I believe, for the Belt and Road Initiative because of the importance of the infrastructure projects. Uh, that will s link the industrial areas of Western China with uh, Europe. Only a year after starting that project, they did a proof of concept and showed that they could move containers from Western China to Germany in 14 days, as opposed to 44 days by sea uh, around uh, India. So, um, it's a very, very important initiative. It's, it's hugely overreaching. Some people say it can't be accomplished, but it's more than just infrastructure. It's now people to people. Uh, it's now industrial investment. And this is something we truly need to pay attention to. And I think, um, knock on wood, that as the Belt Road Initiative becomes better understood, in the United States, despite some of our current problems and continuing problems with China, we will find ways to cooperate because it's to our advantage, <coughs> excuse me, and it's to the advantage of countries like Kazakhstan. So thanks for that good question. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Ambassador Kazakhanov, I want to ask you about an event that before we started you mentioned, and I think it's hugely important. I'm old enough to remember the 1990s, mid-1990s, when Ambassador Sistanovich was the coordinator of the State Department for the former Soviet Union. The State Department talked a lot about regional cooperation. And somehow it 
didn't happen that much because the Soviet Union collapsed and everybody went to their own nation state. Kazakhstan did a better job. Some other countries maybe didn't do as well as Kazakhstan. But everyone was building their own state and pursuing their own agenda. Now you're mentioning that on the 15th of March, there's going to be a big event in Astana. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, thank you, Arya. <clears throat> in fact, um, we're talking about the Central Asian integration. And uh, in the mid-90s, if you remember, uh, President Nazarbayev proposed to establish an organization that uh, we call Central Asian Union. And uh, it was established. Uh, uh, it worked well for two years. And then uh, nothing happened after that. So it was a good attempt. But, uh, but there was not much support from other capitals in Central Asia to that initiative. And uh, we decided uh, to, to not to push forward further this idea and uh, uh, wait and see what will happen next. So luckily, uh, 15 years later, well, no, no, more than 20 years later, when the new winds of changes started to blow in Central Asia, there was, uh, again, a proposal put on the table to bring together the leaders of Central Asia to talk, to sit uh, and talk about the problems of the region uh, and, uh, and discuss other issues. Um, so the leaders agreed last fall that uh, the next meeting of Central Asian uh, presidents will take place in Astana on the 15th of March and, uh, uh, and it will be focused on a very open and frank uh, discussion on issues of security in the region, counter-terrorism, counter-extremism and uh, uh, also the economic cooperation. You know very well that there are many issues, pressing issues that we have in the region including transboundary water resources, border issues, illicit migration, etc. And uh, so I think it will be a very good opportunity to, to talk about all these problems that we have in the region, including uh, uh, the issue of uh, the RLC uh, problem, uh, ecological problems. And of course, I strongly believe that the leaders will talk about uh, Afghanistan and the role of Central Asia uh, to stabilize Afghanistan. So that's, that's the message. Yeah. And to the extent that region uh, reduces barriers to trade, reduces tariffs, reduces number of hours, trucks uh, awaiting on in, to cross borders, that becomes a very interesting uh, region for U.S. business and business from other countries. Yeah, the moment right. you can be in Kazakhstan, manufacture in Kazakhstan, and sell to the whole Eurasian Economic Union that Kazakhstan not, is not only a part of, but President Nazarbayev conceived that idea uh, in 1994. And it took a lot of this from 94 till what, 2001, right? To move ahead no, with implementation. What? 2010. Well, in, in one, they announced yeah. Yeah. a big yeah. customs union or something like that. Yeah. So you know, it becomes a real <coughs> economic, attractive, uh, underdeveloped still market for a lot of goods and services. In that respect, Lisa, if you don't mind me asking, the C5 plus one initiative, how, how is that developing? Because this would take five Central Asian countries in the United States. W what is the time horizon on that? Well, actually, uh, Secretary Tillerson held a C5 plus one meeting with the Ford ministers on the fringes of the UN General Assembly in September. Uh, so I think that's the first time they, they met in this new administration. Uh, of course, they met uh, a few times in the previous administration. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think this was uh, a demonstration that the U.S. would be continuing this format. We see it as an important format. 
Um, I think there are new opportunities for bringing greater Central Asia cooperation, um, particularly with the new leadership in Uzbekistan. And uh, I think that we, we see there are um, opportunities to, to uh, increase the cooperation within Central Asia. This is something that uh, the U.S. firmly supports and would like to encourage, be part of. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, the Deputy Secretary of State, John Sullivan, held a C5 plus one meeting uh, on the fridges of the UN Security Council meetings last week. Um, and I, I'm quite certain we'll see another C5 plus one, uh, you know, within the coming months. Uh, so, you know, I think this is a, a very important format. Uh, for allowing uh, the, diff the countries to talk with each other, to share information, um, to think about ways to work together on the common challenges. Um, the ambassador named a few. I would add to that counterterrorism, uh, counterextremism, uh, given the foreign fighter phenomena, and you know some of the uh, uh, ISIS members, you know some of them being recruited out of Central Asia. Um, concerns about what happens now uh, that we've, you know, had success against uh, the so-called caliphate in Syria and Iraq. Um, are they going to return? Uh, this is something that the U.S. very much wants to cooperate with all the Central Asian states, and uh, this format uh, provides a, a, a great opportunity to do that. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think it's important that uh, the U.S. is seen as committed to this idea of seeing a, um, a Central Asia that's cooperating and has linkages in, you know, economics, diplomacy, um, and and other areas, uh, because I don't think that we we see that same commitment from other uh, countries uh, in in the region. Uh, so I think it's important that that the U.S. Uh, sees this as very beneficial. The the more uh, Central Asia works together, it cooperates on common challenges. Um, you know, that's all to the good as far as the U.S. is concerned. Mm. And if I can add that uh, it is now the turn of Central Asian countries to host next C5 plus one meeting, and we very much hope that Secretary Tillerson will, will pay a visit to uh, uh, our region and we will be able to bring together the foreign ministers of five Central Asian countries and have very productive next C5 plus one region in, in Kazakhstan. <laughs> I have the last question to the panel before we go to the audience. And in no particular order, maybe you would want to start that. Astana emerged as a platform for different dialogues and negotiations. We already mentioned the uh, talks on reducing violence in Syria. Um, Looking at the crises, looking at the role of Kazakhstan in non-proliferation, um, what about Astana as a platform for North Korea nuclear disarmament talks? Or, <laughs> yeah, what about Astana as a platform for discussing the uh, tragic war in Ukraine? What, what do you think about that? And I would encourage uh, both. Uh, uh, Senior Director uh, Curtis and Ambassador Kazakhanov to add to that before we jump to Q&A. Well, I can start very briefly, Ariel, but I'll leave uh, some of the government details to you naturally, Ambassador, and our government thoughts to you, uh, because I'm in neither government right now. Look, the reason that uh, Kazakhstan is hosting the Syria talks right now and conceivably could host talks on North Korea and uh, Ukraine, possibly, is because it has the respect of the major players on the field. Uh, the respect of Russia, the respect of the United States, the respect of um, Europe. Any country involved in a conflict, along with the supporters on either side, know that Kazakhstan is not going to impose its own will 
on the solution. It has no hidden agenda. Uh, this is almost the perfect definition of an honest broker. Uh, and it doesn't even mean that Kazakhstan is leading the negotiations. What it does is provide a kind of diplomatic international safe space where people can sit down who normally would never sit down together uh, under the aegis of a country that has made itself uh, well known for stability and for cooperation throughout the world. Uh, again, this is part of what Nazarbayev has tried to achieve from the very beginning, which is to give Kazakhstan a role to play on the world stage. To provide this kind of negotiation space uh, is a very good way to play that role. And each time it happens, it builds like bricks on a wall the reputation of Kazakhstan as a country that can do that. Very good. Thank you. Lisa? Yeah, as I think I said in my remarks also that uh, Kazakhstan has this unique role uh, and, and knack for bringing together um, parties in dispute and providing a forum for negotiation, for resolution. And uh, the U.S. deeply appreciates uh, that role that Kazakhstan is, is playing. Um, uh, but, you know, with regard to the, the Ukraine uh, process, uh, of course, the U U.S. seeks uh, Russia's full implementation of its commitments under the Minsk agreements as the way forward uh, for resolving uh, the conflict there. Um, and the U.S. continues to work closely with Ukraine, Germany, and France uh, to support the Normandy format engagements. And we do talk uh, directly to Russia uh, to support the Normandy partners' efforts. And uh, we've appointed a special representative for UK Ukraine negotiations, Mr. Kurt Volker, uh, and he's leading this effort. Um, so both President Trump and President Nazarbayev affirmed the need for a diplomatic solution to this conflict, and they discussed uh, different options for breathing new life into the Minsk process. And in that context, uh, President Nazarbayev mentioned that Astana uh, could be uh, a place for future talks. Um, so, you know, I think this, this was something that was looked at. Um, and I, I think uh, the U.S. side uh, liked the idea of a future round of talks, potentially, in Astana. Um, so, you know, that's, that's as far uh, on the Ukraine issue. On the Syria issue um, and the Astana process, uh, we certainly welcome diplomacy uh, that achieves uh, at de-escalation of the violence in Syria and that strengthens the basis for a political settlement of the conflict through the UN-led Geneva process under the auspices of the UNSCR 2254. And um, the U.S. has um, represented, the, United, the U.S. has been represented as observers in some of the Astana talks, but we don't, uh, we're not a, a regular participant, of course. Thank you. And last word, not well, last uh, but not least. I just want to say, uh, Dick Hogland was absolutely right. No hidden agenda. Uh, great respect to President Nazarbayev's balanced foreign policy. And uh, but we understand that uh, any uh, mediation is a very, very slippery ground. I mean, we don't want to punch above our weight, and mm. uh, we want to be. We are very cautious. And uh, so we, uh, uh, we offer the platform, but uh, we don't want to uh, I mean, impose any, 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 uh, any, any new negotiations. I mean, uh, but if we, will, we, if we will be approached, I mean, we will be prepared to play a role. And uh, this is one thing. Another thing which is a uh, 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 little bit funny, I, I asked the foreign minister, uh, Abdrahmanov, I said, we have Syrian talks. We have 16 to 20 uh, opposition leaders coming to Astana uh, for the talks. And I said, like, for example, last week, we have minus 47 in Astana. <laughs> How they feel, I mean. Uh, and, uh, and he told me that they are absolutely happy. I mean, uh, enjoying uh, Astana and, uh, <laughs> and hospitality and, 
And so they are not frightened of uh, coming uh, <laughs> during the winter time to, to my capital. So, which is good, I think. And uh, maybe they, 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 they never see much of the winter in the, in the mm -hmm. Middle East. They, they want well, to, to experience a, a real winter when they come to, <laughs> to us. Yeah, but they, they're so cold that they, they have no, no uh, energy left to fight with each other. So <laughs> that's good. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, I already see a hand. So here's the deal. Please introduce yourself. Uh, tell us who you represent if you represent somebody. Keep it to a question, and it's not right now a format for a long speech, but we will take as many questions as possible. So the gentleman here was signaling early on. Uh, gentleman in the front row. No, no, no. <laughs> Hi, Mohammed Tahir from Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Um, just to continue the, the, the last point, Ariel, you raised about uh, Kazakhstan's role as a platform to provide uh, you know, a, a room, safe room for discussion uh, to normalize tensions. Um, when Nazarbayev was here, President Nazarbayev was here, there was some media reports to that effect that he might have something on his agenda to ease ongoing tension between US and Russia because of the discussion that's ha you know, happening involving Russia. Was it the case or can Kazakhstan provide any role in doing <coughs> anything to bring Russia and uh, United States together? Thank you. Who wants to touch this third rail? This is your baby. <laughs> Well, of course, uh, as you know, Kazakhstan is a peace-loving nation, and uh, we certainly have a strong interest uh, in uh, improvement of the relations between Russia and the United States. And uh, uh, because uh, uh, from the practical point of view, I mean, the, the uh, economic trade turnover between Kazakhstan and Russia uh, is... Uh, is being affected, uh, of course, because of the sanctions and what what we uh, what we are trying to 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 understand. I mean, to 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 see is that certainly uh, uh, Kazakhstan economy uh, uh, will not be should not be affected by that. Uh, but generally speaking, of course, we uh, uh, we hope that uh, eventually the relations between. Uh, U.S. and Russia will will improve. Very good. Uh, you almost asked it before, so go ahead. And uh, Peter yourself. Humphrey, I'm an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. Um, I was shocked at the number of U.S. products in Kazakhstan, and I'm delighted that the Chinese government is building an infrastructure to deliver American products to <laughs> Kazakhstan. Um, I wonder if Kazakhstan has any interest in the TTP, and if so, would Russia discourage that? Would they make it difficult for you to join TTP? TTP, TTP well, it's a little bit far from Kazakhstan, but uh, um, uh, you know that Kazakhstan is a continent, uh, continental country, and... Uh, the UK is expressing interest. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it, it seems to be going well beyond yeah. the bounds. Yeah. Uh, well, whatever, whatever formats that... Uh, uh, are beneficial for Kazakhstani trade and uh, economic cooperation will, uh, is strongly supported. I mean, we, be it bilateral or multilateral, and you know that Kazakhstan is a party of different uh, uh, arrangements that uh, uh, regional and uh, global arrangements that exist. And uh, we just recently, uh, not recently, about uh, oh, three years ago, we became a, a full-fledged members of WTO, and, uh, and I think that. Uh, 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 we would be uh, interested to uh, to increase trade uh, uh, and commercial uh, relations with as many regions in the world as possible. Very good. Um, the gentleman right here. Thank you, Kamran Bukhari, Center for Global Policy and Geopolitical Futures. Um, question for everybody. Um, two days ago, there was a report about uh, the uh, Kazakhstan's military chief meeting with the US defense attache in Astana. 
And there was some, the report said that there would be some defense cooperation. Uh, could you care to elaborate on that? Is, uh, are the two countries engaging in some meaningful defense coalition or, uh, or something like that? And nevertheless, how is uh, Russia taking or you know, absorbing the growing U.S.-Kazakh relationship? Thank you. Well, uh, first of all, I'll uh, uh, give an answer to your uh, last question. Uh, Kazakhstan uh, is an independent nation with its independent foreign policy and economic policy. And uh, uh, we don't have any, uh, uh, I would say, uh, irritation uh, that uh, uh, from uh, either of our neighbors vis-a-vis -vis our uh, uh, foreign policy or economic policy. And uh, we have an excellent cooperation with the United States in a uh, uh, defense uh, sphere. Uh, and we are talking about, uh, we, we signed the uh, five years plan on military cooperation. Our primary focus is the uh, p building peacekeeping capacity of Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, as you know, became a, a non-permanent member of the Security Council, and we want to play a bigger role in uh, peacekeeping uh, efforts of, uh, of the international community, and uh, uh, U.S. experience, U.S. knowledge uh, is uh, huge, and, uh, and we uh, uh, received a great deal of support from the United States in training our peacekeepers, and in fact, we have plans to deploy some of our peacekeepers in existing peacekeeping missions in the world. I'd like to add just a little bit more to that. Uh, U.S.-Kazakhstan defense cooperation is really not new. Uh, uh, it's worth looking into the history of the Step Eagle exercise that takes place every year. Uh, it involves various countries from time to time, but it's always the United States and Kazakhstan. And then I would also like to underscore what the ambassador just said about um, peacekeepers, because that was one of the major roles that uh, the United States played in our defense relationship to build the capacity of the Kazakhstani military to deploy as United Nations peacekeepers. And it took a while, uh, in part because of uh, the I wouldn't say policy differences, but Kazakhs, the, mili the, the members of the military in Kazakhstan tend to turn over quite quickly. They have short tours, whereas peacekeepers need multiple years of training and then multiple years of service. And so we had to make that come together to make it work, but it did. And I, I'm very pleased that this has reached fruition now. Uh, it, it's a good defense relationship. Again, it flies under the radar so that when you see a headline of a meeting like that, you are, oh, is this something new? Uh, in fact, it's not. <laughs> Lisa, do you care to add to that? No, you're fine. Very good. Um, let's see. Uh, we move now from this side of the room to this side of the room. Gentleman in front here. Hi, my name is Mitsuo Nakai, uh, Japan native U.S. citizen, Heritage Foundation. Um, I heard that s there are some North Koreans uh, <coughs> being in your country uh, walking. Uh, that's what I heard. I don't know for sure. Can, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. You know that uh, <clears throat> Kazakhstan position vis-a-vis -vis North Korean missile program is very firm. We uh, strongly condemn uh, uh, the development of this uh, program. We, we strongly condemn the uh, nuclear testing in North Korea. And uh, not too many of you know probably, but uh, Kazakhstan has five monitoring stations that are directly linked to the CTPTO uh, control sta uh, uh, room in ba located in Vienna. So whenever uh, any uh, nuclear uh, testing takes place in uh, uh, North Korea, it is Kazakhstani monitoring stations that are detecting the, uh, the, the, the fact and we are sending signals to, to and you know there is a, it's a global system of monitoring stations in the world that uh, helps to uh, uh, 
control the uh, uh, situation under the auspices of the Comprehensive uh, Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization that is based in, in, uh, in, uh, in Vienna. But uh, uh, we don't have North Korean presence uh, in Kazakhstan, neither workers nor diplomats. In fact, I can tell you more that uh, uh, North Korea has uh, indicated uh, some interest in opening uh, the embassy in Kazakhstan, but we told them that uh, unless you stop your missile program, mm. we will not give you permission to, to, uh, to, 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 to open your embassy in Kazakhstan. So that's our firm position. I'll just add that um, the U.S. has appreciated the support from Kazakhstan on the North Korea issue, as well as Iran, uh, in the U.N. Security Council. And, uh, you know, Ariel pointed out at the beginning uh, the fact that, you know, Kazakhstan made that uh, important decision to forego uh, nuclear weapons you know, 25 yeah. years ago. It turns out it was the right decision. Uh, Kazakhstan, you know, emerging economy. Yeah and uh, good relations uh, with all your neighbors. And um, I think one thing uh, President Trump was, was struck about when he met with President Nazarbayev is just you know, how many good relationships uh, he had across the world. Uh, that was something that very, very much impressed him and, uh, impressed him and made, made a strong impression on him. Thank you. Well, um, in preparation for this event, I sort of scanned the publications and uh, one particular quote uh, struck me uh, as very pertinent here. President Nasrbayev said, if we didn't give up nuclear weapons then, we would look like North Korea now. <laughs> and I thought that was quite interesting. Uh, that gentleman right here was very patient, yes. Mr. Ambassador, my name is Walter Jurassic. Can you tell me what is the difference between relationship between Kazakhstan and Russia, and what is the difference between relationship Ukraine and Russia, former Soviet Republic, and other things, what is the opportunity for small businesses to do in Kazakhstan? <laughs> well, um, we've been living with Russia for the last thousand years, so we know each other very well. And we know the mentality, we know the history, we know the culture, and uh, 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 this is number one. Number two, the first thing that my president did uh, in the early days of independence, first he decided to get rid of the nuclear weaponry and uh, close the nuclear testing uh, ground in Semipolatinsk. And the second thing that not too many people know that he, he did, he started to negotiate the border issues with the neighbors. So it took us 10 years to finalize border agreement with Russia. And, the, and the, we have a border 7,500 kilometers long. This border is even longer than the border between Canada and the United States. And it is in the Guinness Book and uh, the longest continental border between two countries. And we finalized the border agreement with China. Uh, that uh, also took us about uh, nine years to negotiate. So that says for itself, I mean, we don't have any border disputes with, with neither with China nor, nor with Russia. We, lead, we develop, uh, on the contrary, we, be, we develop uh, uh, border trade between two countries. We, uh, we, de we develop uh, uh, confidence uh, building measures and cooperation and uh, so now we call the borders uh, between two countries borders of uh, friendship and cooperation uh, which I think is, uh, is, 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 is uh, fruitful and beneficial for any country and uh, we also have uh, quite, uh, I, I think that President uh, 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 followed very, I mean, President's uh, uh, first steps was to focus on uh, uh, multi-ethnicity of Kazakhstan. You know, unlike any other countries in Central Asia, Kazakhstan is a multi-ethnic society. 
we have only 65% of indigenous population and the rest are representing other ethnic groups, uh, including uh, 3.5 million uh, ethnic Russians living in Kazakhstan, bearing Kazakhstani passports. So again, our strength in our diversity and uh, we treat all the uh, members of our society equally and, uh, and I think that, uh, uh, that distinguishes us from others that uh, we are uh, multi-ethnic and we, uh, we, we, we think that we are united and we are strong by being multi-ethnic. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Uh, gentlemen right here. Please introduce yourself. Hi, Alex Sanchez, I'm a defense analyst. Mr. Ambassador, on the issue of border disputes and conflict solution, I was wondering if you can talk to us about the situation in the Caspian Sea, or Caspian Lake, I guess, depending on how you look at it. Um, is there, has there been any, any developments in the dispute between Russia and Iran and what Rock and Kazakhstan have in it? Thank you. Well, it's a very good question, and uh, I haven't heard much of the uh, similar questions during my uh, uh, tenure in, 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 in the U.S. about the Caspian, but you're absolutely right. The Caspian uh, uh, issue is very important for, for us because we have the longest uh, shore uh, uh, on the Caspian Sea, and we have five littoral states negotiating so-called legal status of the Caspian Sea. And uh, the status of the Caspian Sea has been negotiated for uh, more than 20 years already and so uh, we had recently, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, a meeting of the foreign ministers uh, uh, in one of the capitals uh, to prepare the summit, a meeting on the, Casp on the legal status of the Caspian Sea and we are very close, I hope, very close to reach an agreement on um, on the legal status. We are talking about uh, the, uh, the national zone, the economic zone, and uh, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, the natural resources. And the Caspian Sea is, uh, is a very rich but very fragile uh, 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 ecological uh, basin. And uh, uh, our strong position, Kazakhstan position, that uh, the Caspian Sea has to be a sea of peace and uh, rid of uh, 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 any military presence. And uh, uh, we have uh, oil exploration in the Caspian Sea that uh, also uh, a very delicate uh, 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 issue and uh, we are trying to be as cautious as possible not to harm the ecological system of the, of the, of the sea. We have agreed uh, uh, on uh, uh, seabed boundaries between uh, uh, Russia, Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan on the northern Caspian. Uh, there is no, we signed uh, uh, a border agreement with Turkmenistan along the Caspian uh, 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 Sea. Uh, but uh, again, the issue of the legal status of the Caspian Sea remains to be open, but uh, we are very close to the solution. Thank you. Oh, uh, in the uh, mode of shameless self-promotion uh, when we were at the Heritage Foundation, I had a paper on, a uh, very detailed paper on the status of the Caspian Sea, delineation, Iranian obstructionism to dividing it into national sectors. 2001 Caspian Sea, more than you ever wanted to know. Uh, <laughs> oil and gas question here? Yep. Uh, thank you, Ariel. My name is Anthony Livanios, and I am with uh, U.S. Energy Stream, and I'd like to uh, follow up the question and uh, ask you about energy. An important project was the Kazakh-Azerbaijani uh, energy cooperation, especially the Trans-Caspian Line, the oil cooperation between Kazakhstan and uh, Azerbaijan, and this has been a very ambitious uh, cooperation, given also the vast supplies of the Kashagan oil field. So my question is, can you please tell us about the current state of the uh, Azerbaijani-Kazakh uh, cooperation on the oil field and on the gas field, on the, on the gas uh, sector, and what is the impact 
for the Kazakh Azeri oil cooperation in the Caspian region. Thank you. Well, the, uh, what I would like to say that uh, you heard about this Bakut Belisi Cars Railroad that has been built, and, uh, and certainly we uh, pay a very uh, strong attention to the developments that are happening in, uh, on the other shore of the Caspian Sea. And uh, we are increasing our cooperation with uh, Azerbaijan in many areas, including in the, air, in the energy area. Uh, in, uh, we have uh, Trans-Caspian uh, uh, Oil Transportation uh, Consortium that uh, ships oil by tanks from Kazakhstan shore to to uh, uh, Azerbaijani shores and uh, uh, subject to be increased uh, with the uh, increase of the oil exploration at the Kashagan. And uh, uh, we certainly uh, provide some oil to the famous uh, Bakut Belisi Jehan uh, pipeline. And uh, we think that uh, uh, there is a great potential to, in to, to increase uh, our cooperation from, if I'm not mistaken, uh, our current uh, uh, shipment of oil from uh, Kazakh shore to Azer Azeri shore um, amounts up to 2 million tons a year. We have a capacity to increase it up to 7 billion. Thank you. Almost triple. <laughs> All right. So we have five minutes left. Uh, one last question. And then I would ask the panel to start summarizing okay. and sharing their thoughts. Yeah. Uh, yes, my name is Dia. I work for a, a security, international security management company. Uh, it was very interesting to hear your comments about Chinese initiative in the region. Um, and Ambassador Hoagland, representing the former administration, um, telling us that opposing uh, the Asia Investment uh, Infrastructure Investment uh, Bank was a mistake. Um, I wanted to ask the representative of the current administration if she concurs with Ambassador Hurtis <laughs> on this issue. And we know that Secretary question, Tillerson. Please. <laughs> yes, that's the question okay. to uh, Ms. Curtis. And the question to Ambassador Hoagland is what does he think about the current administration's policy? Uh, and Secretary Tillerson um, essentially uh, announcement uh, of an alliance with India and, and, and uh, Japan that seems to uh, aim to uh, essentially uh, counterbalance uh, the Chinese project. Thank you. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, what, uh, what does Ambassador Hoagland think about Secretary Tillerson making statements uh, in support of strong cooperation with India and Japan, and does it counterbalance China? And the question to you was, Ambassador Hoagland said it was a mistake to oppose Asian Infrastructure Development Bank. What do you think about that? <laughs> I knew that DR is going to throw a monkey wrench here, but. <laughs> sure. So not, not being a China expert, uh, we'll, you know, I'm the uh, deputy assistant to the president on South and Central Asia. <clears throat> but um, so I think that, you know, made an interesting point about, uh, you know, China's interest in uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, particularly uh, Kazakhstan and uh, East-West um, development. And, you know, I think that um, to the extent that this contributes to uh, increasing transportation and uh, linkages with other countries, um, helping develop the Kazakh economy, uh, you know, I think that's very, uh, that could be very beneficial. Um, and certainly there's a need for high quality infrastructure and improved connectivity uh, throughout the region. Um, and so, you know, we would encourage China to promote internationally accepted best practices when it comes to development, financing, and transparent procurement. So, you know, I think that uh, to the extent that um, China's projects do this, um, then, you know, uh, I think that they'll be beneficial uh, for the region. Um, so I'll just, I'll leave it at that. 
Very good. Well, I would say that sometimes it's um, easy to be sort of schematic of how you think about foreign policy. That if we, the United States, are seeking to improve our relations with India and with Japan, that's to contain China. There might be a small element of thinking that goes into that that can't be denied, but there's so much more if you look at it in more detail in why we would want better relationships, especially with India. Look, this is something that we've been working on ever since the end of the Cold War. Because you remember during the many, many years, the decades of the Cold War, uh, uh, India was allied with the Soviet Union and the United States was allied with Pakistan. Um, after that was no longer necessary, we began to work to build a new relationship with India. India is a huge country. It's a huge market. Uh, it has real benefits that we could reap and that they could reap from us. But quite frankly, like many countries, sometimes like the United States, India can be a little bit difficult as a partner and to build a partnership. And so it's taking a good amount of time. But I have seen that we are doing it step by step, step by step. And I think that's to the bilateral advantage of each of those partners. And it would have almost nothing to do with the containment of China. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, with that, we have, depends which clock you're looking at, between one and three minutes. <laughs> So I would encourage the panelists, who I think did a terrific job, very detailed, a lot of thought. But let's start with you, Ambassador. Parting thoughts, how can we preserve, develop, and improve this very important enhanced strategic uh, 